So Emily, hi, Julie. So we're ready to go. So, um, and uh, David will be joining us shortly, right? That's the, oh, there. Yep, it looks like he's joining us right hi, now. Hi, David. You're okay, we're good. So um, I want to call the meeting to order for the Futures Committee for Monday, July 13th. Thank you all for joining us and we're participating. We, um, this is a subcommittee of council where we uh, talk about things that aren't on our near term agenda and allows us to uh, lift our heads up and, uh, and uh, look at the horizon and think about I, um, uh, directions that our community is going and have conversations. And so we're, we're uh, uh, so appreciative today to have uh, Patty and David with us to talk about the future of community engagement and capacity building within communities. Um, we are um, offering this as a, a, as a remote um, uh, meeting. So we're on Zoom and, and, uh, and if somebody wants to participate, uh, there's uh, uh, information as a part of this agenda that it's a public uh, meeting to participate uh, in this uh, particular meeting. As we get started, um, uh, you know, I describe briefly what uh, Futures Committee is, and, and uh, um, each month we have a topic that we uh, that we uh, ha have a, basically a conversation. So um, it tends to be more free flowing of ideas, and and uh, uh, we talk about this as being a think tank, a think and do tank. So basically, the ideas are brought forward by our partners and capacity friends. And, uh, um, and uh, as uh, the storm is now going through Fort Collins, so wherever you are, um, it's beginning to hit for about the next half hour. So hope you're in a safe place uh, for that. So um, as a think tank, and then we have a do tank. So at the end of uh, uh, our, uh, our conversation, then um, J Jackie summarizes our our, our discussion and, and we try to identify some next steps that we might pursue to learn more, to have a conversation, to bring things to our community. So as we get started here, our first uh, order of business is approval of our uh, June 8th meeting minutes. And do I have a motion to that effect? Yeah, um, I move approval of the June 8th meeting minutes for the Futures Committee. Thank you, Julie. Second. Thank you, Emily. So with that, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? So um, that, uh, uh, that item passes. And with that, we head into our item for today, which is the future of community engagement, uh, civic capacity building. And I'll turn it over to Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. Great. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening to you and members of the committee. I'm just so excited to be continuing these conversations about the future of our community as they're really relevant in the present now of responding and recovering um, to the impacts of COVID. So um, if you'll recall, when we were re-looking at our schedule for the rest of 2020, and um, you all had a dialogue about what are some items that you really wanna prioritize talking about during this time. And um, one of them that rose to the top was that what do community led processes and the future of engagement look like? And it's, it's tied to your priority of reimagining community engagement, which we'll have a work session on soon. And so um, we were really fortunate that um, Patty Schmidt and David McPhee are, were willing and able to join us tonight to lead a dialogue around that. What does the future of community-led processes look like as we're reimagining engagement during this um, kind of adapted way of engaging with each other, but also so many other um, parts of our community conversation about new ways of doing things. Um, I remember having kind of a pre-COVID meeting with Patty downtown and was describing research um, related to a civic capacity index and really thinking through how is it that we understand our community's ability to engage um, in local policy making and processes and, and program design. And so um, knowing that at that point it was in the more nascent stages of research and now we're here tonight that David and um, Patty are going to be able to share about that index among other 
um, initiatives that they lead to support those community-led processes and trends of, that they're seeing now that will help us be thinking about the future. So just wanted to share um, both of their bios to kind of help give everyone who's able to join us virtually tonight um, context of who were, you know, these amazing thought leaders that we have here in our community and have had in our community for decades doing this work. So Patty Schmidt um, has worked in the community development field in the state of Colorado for over two decades, um, as, you know, really focusing on that leadership and civic engagement. She's a leader in the state for guiding that systemic change in communities, designing best practices for public policy and program development, and for building effective networks and, community and collaborations for positive outcomes, really focusing on, again, community-centered and family-centered, um, which you know, makes sense in terms of where Patty is now. She's the director of the Family Leadership Training Institute of Colorado Initiative at CSU Office of Engagement and Extension. And her work involves providing guidance to communities um, looking to create systemic change. We talk a lot about systems at futures and, um, and to some of their most complex social, health, economic, and environmental challenges with an emphasis on equity, all just so timely in terms of what this committee has been talking and thinking about. Um, FLCI, that Family Leadership Training Institute, has received um, several state and national awards. And in addition to her work there, she's also a leader of several important health equity and community development collaborate, um, collaborative efforts. And so health equity was a topic we discussed two months ago with a colleague from Denver. And Patty's also committed to bringing people from across communities together for honest conversations about difficult issues and doing that in a way that honors the expertise of all individuals at the table, which I know is a, a big theme of our state of the city. So, so excited to have Patty here. Welcome, Patty. And um, also want to share the bio of David Mackey. So David has been a professor in the Human Development and Family Studies at CSU since 1985. So definitely has seen this community, you know, as we've as we've changed and evolved. And his research and teaching is really focused on parenting, risk and resilience, also timely topics, prevention science, and positive youth development. Um, common threads of this work have been diversity and inclusion, as well as evaluations of family strengthening interventions. Most recently, his applied research has been focusing with Patty at the Family Leadership Training Institute and its effects on civic engagement, positive use of development, community resilience, and health equity. He is the co-leader in developing the Civic Capacity Index, which I referenced along with Patty and David Christmas, and as a part of CSU's extension statewide community needs assessment as well. And he serves as the interim director for CSU's School of Social Work. So again, just so delighted to have Patty and David here. We had a wonderful prep call where we all just felt so excited that we're going to get to, um, you know, share this work with the Futures Committee. And um, with that, I will turn it over to Patty and David. Thank you so much. David, we can't hear you. How about now? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. Welcome to the age of dysfunctional IT and dysfunctional men operating it. So anyway, um, thank you for inviting us. I really look forward to this. We're both excited about it. Uh, let me just give a, a little brief introduction of myself and hand it over to Patty, and she'll be running the show mostly. So in my 35-year academic career, almost all of it spent here. Um, Community engagement and equity and inclusion have been my, the centerpieces of my applied research and teaching, um, along with interventions to promote individual and family resilience. And my seven year collaboration with Patty and more recently with David Chrislip of the Kansas Leadership Center, but he lives in Boulder, have expanded my horizons to include community resilience which we'll discuss is, is intimately related to community-driven change and civic capacity. And among the insights that we might gain from the current pandemic are just how central community-engaged work and addressing social injustice are to civic capacity. They're absolutely core. And in my handoff to Patty, um, in my 35 years of doing community-based program evaluation. I have never seen a program have as much impact on the participants, and we're also finding impact on the community as the Family Leadership Training Institute, which 
Patty, as you mentioned, Julian, the overture has been directing. So at that, I'll hand it over to Patty for um, introducing herself. Thanks, David. Hey, everybody. I'm really excited to be here today and just thank, you know, uh, Jackie and Megan and all of the city leadership for inviting us and giving us an opportunity to talk about work that I just love to accord. You know, before we go into the content, I also wanted to share why I like to do this work. And um, it's really a story that maybe some of you might have heard already. But it, it happened several years ago when I was mentoring a youth. And um, she was a spunky youth. She was 13. She thought she had all the answers to the world. And she loved life and was really committed to making a difference in community, which, you know, is something that I love too. So I just was so honored to have that opportunity to work with her and just be a friend with her and to learn from her. And in, um, in that, during that time, one morning I was at my office, I was at my desk and I was working and I got a call from her mom. And I thought at first she was calling me because her birthday, her daughter's birthday was the following week. And so I was thinking she, she was calling me to see what we could do for her birthday. And what instead I quickly learned was she wasn't calling me to tell me about her birthday. She was calling me to tell her that, tell me that she had passed away. And what I le later learned is that she passed away from an overdose of drugs. And, you know, in my mind, I couldn't comprehend how a 13 year old would get drugs and, you know, what, what would drive her to use drugs and overdose on drugs. I just didn't understand. And what I did know was that there wasn't an easy answer to that question and that there was a lot of people needed and a lot of systems put in place that would stop from things like a 13 year old being able to hurt herself with drugs like that. And um, that experience has really driven me to look at how do we truly do systems change work? How do we involve more people so that they feel like they have a sense of belonging? And how do we look at new innovative ways that bring collective voices and collective ideas together in order to make sure that all people in our community feel like they belong to the community? So as Jackie mentioned, I am the director of the Family Leadership Training Institute of Colorado. And what the Family Leadership Training Institute is, is a statewide collaborative that really is looking to bridge the gap between community members and decision makers to foster the co-creation of programs and policies that re reflect multiple voices. Uh, core to the FLTI program is our 20 week leadership program that we have a class here locally. So if you haven't connected with some of your local FLTI graduates, I would highly recommend you to do so. They represent all kinds of diverse voices and um, really are probably some of the folks you're hearing a lot from these days. And so it's just my honor to be here to represent that voice. So today we're here to really talk about those community challenges, those adaptive challenges, those issues that at the face really look overwhelming. Whether we're talking about racial injustice, systemic racism, health equity, job loss, economic recovery, the pandemic, global warming, those are all challenges that we know don't have an easy answer, that take a lot of people, a lot of people with varied experience in order to really make a dent in what those issues are doing for our community. And what David and I are going to talk a lot about today is how can we look forward and strengthen our community knowing that at any time these challenges will bubble up to the surface. We need different systems, different networks, different styles of collaboration. And what we will talk about is how we can do that in a community driven way. The ESRI report that comes out of CSU and our Office of Engagement predicts that in 10 years, the city of Fort Collins is probably looking at about 25% of our population being representative of the Latinx community. So that, you know, that change in 10 years coupled with the many different changes we will most likely see in the next 10 to 20 years really 
pushes us to look at ways that we can better collaborate, co-create po policies and strategies that reflect multiple voices. And you know, from my work in community development across the state, what I've really found that communities struggle the most with is really how do we bring community to the decision making table? So what are the ways that we engage community? Do we report to them what we're thinking about doing and getting their feedback? Or do we have a, a variety of methods that we engage community? Are we able to roll up our sleeves, partner with community, act with community, and learn with community? Jackie mentioned the priority areas that you know we're really focusing in on tonight, but um, I just wanted to mention them again as really looking at when we have a strong capacity for community-driven change or civic capacity, we really are strengthening our ability as a community to address equity and inclusion and reimagining engagement. So how will our community work together in the next 10 years? There's a lot of strengths in what the city of Fort Collins is already doing. I've had the honor to partner with many of you who are doing really strong work, but there's always room for us to look at how can we make this even stronger? What are new dynamic ways that we can work together? One of the things that research has demonstrated to us over time is that you know, no longer are the days where one agency, one organization, one person, one sector will be able to solve our most pressing challenges in community. So many people are grappling with how do we collaborate together across sectors and get that community voice in there so that we know that the strategies we're choosing are the most effective ones. One of the areas that a lot of my work really falls into and David's work is around bringing not only our content experts the people who are paid or elected to do this work together at the decision making table with our context experts. Those people who have been hardest hit by different issues or challenges in our community and who have a lot of lived experience in that area. You know, that includes not only adults, but we really need to look at how we can also include that youth voice. So, what this boils down to, I always like to try to simplify things as much as possible. What we're talking about in our community is how can the city of Fort Collins in the next 10 years learn, plan, and act together. And the, the phrase that we use to talk about this is civic capacity. So when a community has a strong civic capacity, they have a strong ability for community-driven change. So why community-driven change? Well, community-driven change demonstrates through a lot of years of research that it's more effective in creating long-lasting change, it's more inclusive and democratic, and that communities with a capacity for community-driven change are more resilient. And David's gonna talk a little more about that in just a bit. Not only do we get these results when we have community-driven change, but it's also a part of the seven vital conditions for community well-being. The WIN Network, who is a national partner with the CDC, identifies one huge area to strengthen community is to increase that sense of belonging and civic muscle. David, did you have something to say? Okay. <laughs> you look poised, so I thought I'd ask. So, 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 the next thing when, look, when thinking about your civic capacity or your ability for community-driven change, it connects to many different benefits or outcomes for our community. One of the connections that's really important is how directly related civic capacity is to social connection. When, when a community has a strong social connection for individuals and groups, especially our marginalized groups, you're more likely to see people feeling connected and feeling like they belong to the community. So ask yourself, right now, do all individuals, all groups, especially our marginalized groups, do they feel like they belong to this community? Do they feel like they belong at the decision-making table? 
Well, research talks to us about what a low social connection can do for our community. When individuals have a low social connection and sense of belonging, it can be worse for their health than smoking, high blood pressure, or obesity. It can increase people's susceptibility to anxiety and depression, slow their recovery from disease, increase antisocial behavior and violence, and you will see a higher rate of suicide. Now, couple this understanding with what we're seeing right now in community and, you know, our recommendation, public health recommendations of, you know, quarantining ourselves and keeping a distance from ourselves, the pressure for a community to make sure that their individuals and groups feel like they belong and that they have a connection to the community is really high. And the result for when you do see a high social connection can lead to longer longevity of life, higher self-esteem and empathy. When you empathize with another group who's different from yourself, you're more likely to work with them and partner with them, whether or not you agree with them. Lower rates of anxiety and depression and stronger immune systems. So civic capacity and the ability for community-driven change is definitely connected to that sense of belonging and social connection. And David's gonna talk to us how it's directly related to individual and community resilience. So um, this slide captures some of the core elements of individual and family resilience. And I'll just walk through that very briefly and then link it to the broader community resilience because there are a lot of parallels there, and a lot of these are uh, quite often touch points for doing intervention work. So in the last couple of decades, we've learned a great deal about what contributes to individual and family resilience. And I can tell you chief among them, uh, fingers on one hand, are things like coping skills, uh, problem solving and reframing of issues, for example. Uh, and there won't be an exam about this after I'm done, uh, trust me on that. Um, social support and other resources in the family and broader context are absolutely critical to resilience, both individual and family. Risk reduction, especially involving policies that mitigate social injustice, are a core part of resilience. And then adaptive processes in complex systems like family. So, how do they adapt when the wheels fall off a little bit or when they experience a crisis? And there are also parallels between that and community resilience, and there's a future slide that I'll talk you through about community resilience, but some of these parallel processes that characterize community resilience are problem solving that involve multiple stakeholders. Uh, community resources, which is parallel social support, that include coalitions and social capital, policies and practices that address inequities, state level, local, community level, and especially, especially adaptive processes that are fundamentally democratic and messy, that is community-driven change. So again, um, across all of these contexts, individual, family, and the community, we're seeing very parallel processes that are critical to a well-functioning system and that uh, are touch points for doing intervention work like we do, Patty and I. Your turn, Patty. Thanks, David. Next slide. So, so then the question is, you know, I'm always, I'm a doer. David always says I'm, I'm the person who's really focused on the action. So let's break it down a little bit. What does, community-driven change actually look like. So this slide really breaks down some of the principles of how community-driven change is different, how a systems approach is different from traditional top-down externally driven efforts. So you can look at things like who does the work? Is it organizations and agencies? Or do you also involve neighborhoods, communities, and regions? What is your process like? Do you announce decide, make a decision about what you think should happen and then announce what you're gonna do and get feedback? Or do you allow folks to really set the agenda, help decide what the problem st solving strategies are going to be and build the supports you need in community for it to happen? Other things that are different with community-driven change is who's exercising the leadership? 
if it's always the city of Fort Collins who's facilitating those meetings, how can we begin to look at how we can share the power, share leadership roles in order to really empower that community driven change? So where do we start? What, what can be a launching pad for looking at how you can build on the assets or the strengths that the city of, city of Fort Collins already has and really dive into what does community driven change look like in the city of Fort Collins? Well, I mentioned that I'm the doer. So, you know, that really was something that drove me. When I was looking at how do you really do systems change? I agreed with it in theory, but how do you do it in practice? I, I was fortunate enough to have some really strong partners like David McPhee and David Crislip who was, were thoughtful and had a range of experience to sit down and really focus on developing a tool that communities could use in order to figure out how they could work together to make decisions, solve problems, and adapt in a crisis. So the Civic Capacity Index is a diagnostic tool that gives you a place to start on looking at how you can strengthen your practices. It's for foundations, governments, civic actors, nonprofit organizations, and community groups looking to strengthen the capacity of either their community or their organization around civic capacity. And now I'll turn it over to David to talk specifically about how it was created and can be used. All right, thanks. Um, so what we did largely at David Chrislip's um, initiation was created a panel of 34 experts in leadership. Um, many of them were academics who had done a lot of research and publications on leadership, but we also had politicians involved, including the former mayor of Wichita, um, a state senator from the local area, we also involved practitioners uh, on the ground who were doing community-based leadership development. So it was a diverse set of people, and all of them were asked to generate descriptors that described community-driven change. What are the features of community-driven change? It was that open-ended. And they generated, among the 34 of them, somewhere around 600 or so statements. Um, we spent hours and hours winnowing out uh, the duplicates down to a set that we then distributed to the panel of experts and gave them a simple instruction. Take these 167 items and place them into separate piles that make sense to you. Um, that, that was it. And then with some statistical wizardry, I'm not going to go through that. I, I'm the sort of data nerd of the group. Uh, we identified seven clusters that is on a later slide, but we'll get to that in a second. Well, okay, we'll, we'll, start, with, uh, we'll start with how it can be used. Go ahead, Pat, and leave that one up. Um, so the intention here is um, it can be used to help communities identify areas of strength and areas that might need more attention. And for those areas that might need more attention, how can we help them to uh, strengthen those particular areas, whether it's equity areas, coalitions, uh, community-driven change from the bottom up, whatever. Um, it's designed as a framework for helping along the collaborative process, uh, for collaborating, trust building, that kind of thing. Uh, one thing that we're talking about now, I'm kind of all over the map here while you're reading this slide, but uh, we have been talking to um, folks in Kansas as well as Colorado, including state epidemiologists, to help us identify communities who, in their judgment, vary in community resilience in response to COVID-19. And those communities who are differing in their resilience should differ on the civic capacity, so it's a way of validating that measure and providing the feedback loop to communities for, say, here uh, is what strengths you have going forward for future crises, or here's some areas that might need some attention in order to adapt better to the particular crisis. So we're really thinking about it as a practical tool. Uh, Patty and I are using it in the current project, dual capacity building, as a pre and post test to see 
if in fact by bringing together context and content experts that we are moving the needle on the civic capacity of the community in terms of working on initiatives. So look, next slide, Patty, let's go to that. Um, the panel of experts identified seven different domains, clusters, scales, if you will, and they're all listed here. And what I'm going to do just to give these a little bit of concreteness is I'll, I'll just read an item from the Civic Capacity Index that reflects each one of these to get a, a flavor for what we're tapping into. In collective leadership, diverse community members have a meaningful and ongoing leadership role in the community's change. Um, confronting racism and injustice, the community works openly to address past racial and injustice. And again, I'm going to pause here that in the civic capacity slash community driven change literature, all of these pop up as sort of separate elements. We brought them together. And you're also looking at seven elements, core elements of community resilience. Uh, institutional synergy could be defined by this item. Institutions know that communities can and should be equal partners in creating policies and solving problems. An engaging civic culture might be represented by social capital that is being built. Neighbors know and support each other, which facilitates partnerships and mobilizing action. Organic coalitions would be coalitions proactively build relationships with those who are aligned as well as those who may be opposed. One element you'll see in civic capacity is that conflict, change, and messiness are common elements that need to be dealt with in uh, co-constructed leadership. Purposeful collaboration, there's an intentional concerted strategic effort to do whatever it takes to address challenges as, uh, for fair and just results. And I'm learning together, finally, the ways in which the community is engaged are inclusive and flexible, meeting the needs of diverse audiences. There are lots of ways to engage. So those are the, the seven elements or dimensions of uh, Civic Capacity Index, all of which are eminently practical in terms of uh, areas that can be changed through intervention, work policies, and so forth. So your turn, Patty. So the seven key areas really highlight ways in which communities can look at those seven areas and assess where they're at in those areas and look for ways that they can strengthen their civic capacity. So it would identify things like, how can we change the systems of collaboration that we have that may be slowing participation from certain groups? Or it, are there tools that can help more people feel like they belong at that decision-making table? Um, one of the things that uh, I've noticed a lot is, how can we truly learn together? So I say that because, you know, um, learning should be a lifetime goal and you know we need to continue to look at how do we learn from our community how do we honor the experience that those context expert the community members with lived experience how do we set up a system that allows them to feel like they can contribute and help us to learn how to understand the systems we're trying to impact um, a great example of this, and I, I, a little shout out to one of your City of Fort Collins own, Megan Overton, who was on our panel for uh, the development of the Civic Capacity Index, is the work that Home to Health is doing right now. This is a great example of cross collaboration where you're bringing different groups together and really being thoughtful about what's your objective, what's the impact you're trying to have related to what they're working on at affordable housing and health equity, and how do we engage community and partners, bring people together to really move the needle on these really difficult but important issues. And then David mentioned its connection to resilience, but uh, the resilience and also the pandemic, but I'll let you elaborate a little more on that, David. Okay. Uh, next slide. I think it's got a list of uh, different elements here. 
So um, this is a bit of a revisit for uh, what I already mentioned in terms of the Civic Capacity Index, but developing a Civic Capacity Index, I wouldn't say forced us to dive into the community resilience literature. It was more because I, and I don't have a formal background in leadership, but I do in resilience. So I thought, well, this looks really familiar. So I started reading a lot in the community resilience literature, and this list on the left-hand side of the slide came up repeatedly as the core elements. Maybe there are 12 of them, but these come up repeatedly in the research literature, in the program uh, planning and evaluation and delivery literature. I already talked about social justice. One of the items on the Civic Capacity Index is about social capital. The very first um, cluster is on collaborative leadership. Collective efficacy comes up, which is part and parcel of civic capacity. We don't really have a measure in the civic capacity index of resource equity, but it's a core part of uh, community resilience is having access to adequate resources and equitably distributing them throughout the community. And again, we keep returning to this um, term adaptive ability, but civic capacity, community-driven change, community resilience are very much about um, adaptation to crises, to stressors, uh, to emerging issues, and does the community or the individual have the resources available, the inherent uh, ability, which I don't particularly like that term because it can lead to victim blaming, but does the overall system have the ability to adapt? That's a core feature of community resilience, and it's also measured by civic capacity. So in your thinking about um, community engagement as well as equity and social justice, this list will give you an idea of things that you might want to hone in on in terms of responding to the current crises both the ones related to racial injustice and the pandemic, and preparing for future crises that you might uh, encounter in the next 10 or 20 years. So, Patty? So, the Civic Capacity Index is a tool to provide you a map of where are places that you can strengthen what is being done in the City of Fort Collins and engagement practices. When it boils down to it, think about, you know, truly looking, diving into where and how do we learn with our community, plan with our community, and also act with our community. We'd like to leave you with this question uh, before we start um, hopefully having some question and answers is really, you know, asking yourself, what is the difference that will make the difference in the city of Fort Collins. How do we create innovative platforms where we can experiment, we can collaborate, and we can make those processes as inclusive as possible so that everyone feels like they belong at that table and that they feel like they have something to give back to their community. We know that we know that right now it can be really easy to be overwhelmed or feel, you know, a sense of hopelessness. But hopefully this gives you hope that there are ways that moving forward, we can work together as a community to strengthen our ability to bounce back when things get tough. Thanks. Very good, thank you very much. And this is a very timely topic for, for us. And, and actually it's very much in line with I think uh, philosophically what we've as a community been trying to do and that in related to engagement, that's more or less flip the model where it's not about city hall at six o'clock, but it's really uh, the community, each individual where they are um, and uh, their individual circumstances, but in the context of community. And my first question um, is how do you define community? Is it, um, is it just a gathering of of various uh, individuals and, and groups, um, it, does it, can you 
do you think of a community like a, a, a city or a town like Fort Collins and communities within communities and then bringing those together to create a, a capacity index? And is, is, have you done some of that with regards to uh, cities or towns and how, how is their capacity and so forth? Mm -hmm. well, I can give you a specific answer and then let um, maybe Patty extend on that because she's done much more uh, boots on the ground community work, but I'll read you the instructions for the city capacity index because we really wrestled with that. Um, we had some confusion on the part of the panel of experts, those who were running leadership programs. So what well, do you mean the, the group that's in front of us and other people who work with the community writ large had a different answer. So. Here's what we settled on. Um, the Civic Capacity Index can be used with different stakeholders, from neighborhood coalitions to people taking a leadership development program to a formal committee or a task force. Stakeholders are those who are concerned about or are affected by an issue uh, or who can influence decisions about an issue. So we, we left it fairly broad and left it up to the particular respondent to define with their group uh, what community they have in mind. And you asked about um, who has it been used with? Nobody yet. Um, so we have just rolled it out as of what, about a month ago or less than that. And the nice thing is a lot of people are excited about using it. So we've already established a working relationship with the Larimer County Recovery Team, for example, as a potential user. Uh, we're planning to use a Patty and I in our intervention program, so that will be a uh, a leadership development program. So again, um, I wouldn't say use your imagination about community, but we leave it up to the respondents to define the parameters of that. And Patty, I don't know if you want to expand on that a bit. But. I think that was really good. I think, you know, Mayor Toxel, you really uh, nailed the head on the nail. I never get sayings right. But <laughs> um, community is how a community defines itself. There's definitely smaller communities within the larger community and, you know, um, thinking through community, you want to be thoughtful about that so that you find a place for how you engage with different groups. You know, as a, as a, as a city, we get a lot of things where we're evaluated against some kind of criteria or assessed against some kind of an index. And I, I would just cite one is the equity and inclusion. And I'm, I might be getting that wrong, but it, it's related to, you know, how we're we doing in terms of diversity and so forth within our community. And, and we get rated on that and, and like a lot of other things, you know, um, great place to retire and other sorts of things. And, and so there are other kind of metrics out there. And, um, you know, I was just, do you envision like a, and, and again, I'm thinking from a city perspective, but it, and all the seven outcomes areas are very much aligned with what we're trying to have conversations about and do and, and to better understand and that sort of thing. So do you envision some sort of assessment or self-assessment um, related to those outcome areas um, and broadly speaking within, and, and I would use community here as being, you know, basically what we call the city of Fort Collins. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely see that that could be something that the city of Fort Collins could do. I think that right now, as we validate the tool and, you know, pilot its use in various communities, we've designed a four, four element process where we work hand in hand with the communities that are using the tool to make sure that we are really thoughtful about the resources and direction that we can help provide, you know, as you uncover where you're at in the seven elements. We definitely are avoiding like comparing communities so that so that there, you know, there isn't any hesitancy to utilize the index, but really, you know, giving you a place and giving, you know, foundations and groups and organization a place to say, you know, we could be doing this a little differently and or we could build on this a little differently. And what might that look like? Yeah, you know, definitely there's a lot here in that you know, it begins to identify and, and frame and name, you know, and have conversations about and, and, and those sorts of things. And um, I, right, 
you know, right now, and I, you know, I'm in the College of Engineering, but I know of a couple of assessment tools related to community, related to resilience, uh, John Vandalin's project, um, and then also like Mazdaq Arabi. Um, and I'm thinking of in, in these seven areas, thinking of a spider diagram, and you just, it's, it's really you know where you're strong, you know, you've got a lot of capacity, and then those areas that you may not have really addressed, and, you know, so it, it you know, it's, and again, it's more of a, inwardly focused instead of a comparative, you know, uh, you know, you're a top of the heap kind of a thing. And, and so I'm kind of thinking of, you know, those as examples. Um, and the last thing I'd mention is, um, you know, thinking about equipping and operationalizing. You know, we've used uh, Martine Carcasson a lot with uh, Center for Public Deliberation and having those conversations about, you know, and, and take, you know, is wicked problem conversation, but, you know, it really provides for a discourse in a way that, um, it, 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 and, and that's where I see some sort of a way of having conversations that get at, you know, the, 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 uh, the you know, the, the, the civic capacity discussions, if you will. And uh, anyway, and uh, anyway, I think a lot of great work here and I, 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 I like, and I want to learn more about it. So, um, Julie or Emily? I will mention as you're switching to those that Martin was one of our panelists as well. He's definitely a strength in this area for sure. Yeah, you bet. I think Julie. And if I could pitch in one follow up comment, um, Wayne, that uh, from what you had said, uh, who, who's involved in this? We want to make sure that when communities use this, that they get a, a, as representative of a sample as possible. So when we're going to be collecting data about communities' resilience here in Kansas, what we're going to do is try and throw the net very widely. Um, county commissioners, city council members, advisory committee members, but you know, other people that may be typically overlooked in the traditional consumption, consumption of leadership so we get very different perspectives on the particular community uh, rather than you know, the kind of tried and true. This is also be used, uh, being used in the statewide extension community needs assessment. And we're encouraging the county agents to also cast their net widely when they're using it, relying on um, focus groups and others to recommend people or suggest people who might be able to fill it out. No, I think that's Sorry for no, I think that's great. You know, I, one of my um, experiences, um, you know, being involved with the city and then also um, in, 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 you know, a university perspective, but, um, you, you know, I think it's interesting what you define as community. Um, you know, counties and cities, when you get to the same table, they're not looking at the same thing. They might be looking at it just from a different perspective. And, and you might be using the same words, but the conversation tends to be a little different, you know, in terms of, of what you're trying to do. And that's where you use the word content and context. And, you know, the context are the agency, I think, those that have agency. It may be the content are often those groups that may not have agency, you know, like, uh, you know, um, you know, in a certain group, but they, you know, they're not formalized in any sort of a way, you know, it's just kind of a, um, uh, an identifiable group. And, and so I think that's interesting and too, between that, that agency and non-agency in these conversations and how, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I know that w w in some cases we've, we have discussions that are known to involve the county just because it's a whole different conversation if it's county and city, because you know missions are different, the uh, functions are different, and and but they're both electeds, and it might be other elected bodies too, school district or um, health district or what have you, and then but, but you know um, but lumping them in, they might all be in Fort Collins, they may see different. Op, they might have very different optics as it relates to their agency in that um, uh, conversation. So that just, you know, I think that's all interesting in how this plays and how it might um, be utilized, uh, at least uh, in Fort Collins. Yeah, 
Emily? Did... Sure, yeah. Thank you, Patty and David, for, for coming and presenting. Um, I really like the Civic Capacity Index. And, um, you know, I'm really passionate about community-led processes and community-led development. So this was a great, um, I really like this tool and, and seeing that developed. Um, you know, one thing that I was thinking about, and Patty, to your question at the end, is that um, the comment about sharing power and leadership roles, and how does the city move into a place of not always hosting, um, but, but sharing that. And I think that, you know, the city does a good job of going out and getting feedback on, on documents or plans and, and where we're heading. But how, how do we kind of put community members more in that shared power and leadership roles for doing that? So I think that's something interesting to explore at the city level of, of how do we utilize and leverage um, the resources that we have to expand that to other people. And um, to me, I think part of that is that community members don't always have that sense of belonging or feel like they can come to the table. And so, you know, I, I, that's one of the reasons I like FLTI is really um, doing that leadership development and showing people that they can have a seat at the table, connecting them with the decision makers so that they can learn how to um, uh, advocate and kind of leverage. And so I think that's great and wondering how can we expand that um, to more people um, to create this. Um, and so one of the questions I had for you too is, you know, either as a city or just in your work, how, how do you start something um, like this? So I think of like um, neighborhoods in my district that have some internal, um, kind of like when you look at a neighborhood, some conflicts or, um, you know, different competing values. And so when you look at those neighborhoods, <coughs> how do you work with communities and how do you get that started? whether it's the city doing that or other organizations to really start these kinds of conversations and getting those people to come together. Well, thank you, Councilwoman Gorgel. Um, you know, that's a great question. And I think, I think it's Mayor Troxel who says this, right, that you have to be willing to try things and for things not to work out for it to be okay for them not to work out, to know what the best way to do that is. I think a couple of things come to mind. I don't think there's one answer for, to that question, but in thinking long-term, if we don't invest in programs like FLTI, you know, programs that really build that capacity for people to think they belong at that table, we are less likely to see the dynamic of who is at the table to change. So that, you know, long term is thinking about what, what, are, what are the different ways that we can strengthen people's willingness and understanding of how to just operate in the systems that we have. Another thing um, around that shared leadership model then is, you know, supporting work that allows for that community-driven change to boil up, so or bubble up, not boil up. But really, you know, when people have an idea of, you know, we really need to do this, what is the process to help move that conversation forward? You know, programs like FLTI help provide a process on how to do that, but, you know, what kind of organizations and systems do we have that support moving an idea into a conversation and into action? So there's a lot of different models on how to do that. And um, a lot of times it just takes, you know, designing different platforms where people can come together and really ruminate about an idea and then, you know, focus on action around that. You know, it can happen in different ways, but you know, one of those areas is thinking long term about who could we support that we know is supporting people's engagement in community, and then also, um, you know, what kind of platforms do we have for people to collaborate together that are inclusive of more than just the people who always show up? David, did you want to add to that? No, I have a slightly different answer than the platform to respond to your question. And that is, uh, you mentioned something about what, are, what if neighborhoods are in conflict. And I think one thing I've learned from both evaluating FLTI and working with Patty and David is that a common element is having difficult conversations where there are opposing viewpoints where there's conflict like that. 
one reason I think FLTI is so effective, I know this from interviewing, I know about 70 of the graduates and what they gain from the program is almost to a person, they say, it opened their eyes to different perspectives on the world and learning how to talk about them and how to have deep, sometimes very emotional conversations that might involve conflict and to work that out. There's a, a couple of folks at the University of Denver who have uh, done a lot of in-depth research on what makes for effective community working groups. Building trust and having open communication are core elements of that as well. So time and again, you find this issue of how to bring people together who might have widely divergent perspectives on an issue, like the Center for Public Deliberation does, and find a way forward where they can reach some kind of common ground or understanding. So I don't know if it's a partial answer to your question. I think Patty gave you the, the better overview of it. Um, but th that, that would be one thing I think we've learned from our lived experience doing this work and what's in the literature. No, I think it's great. Thank you so much. Um, that's all my questions, but before I hand it over to Julie, uh, Jackie, I just wanted to see if we, if folks um, tuning in can type in questions or if, if we're doing that again and just let people know how to do that. Yeah, we do have the chat working and uh, Sue's already asked a question that uh, uh, David's answered and that is uh, uh, the con text experts are those with lived experiences and and that's the um, that's the and that's correct so thanks uh, and so use the chat that's a good way to capture thoughts that are out and we have a very active group here today with with uh, 42 participants so glad that uh, everybody's joining us here today for this conversation so julie are yeah thanks um and yeah thanks patty and david so I'm going to say a bunch of things, and I think there's a question in here somewhere. So I'm going to suss it out. Um, and it is around that contact context experts. Um, and you know, in just over a year of being on council, I've kind of seen um, what our community engagement process looks like. Um, and I believe, as it was pointed out a few months ago, this is the first time that. Um, there was some noise from the community about fatigue from uh, giving feedback that we were asking for feedback all the time, of the same people. Um, and I'm in thinking about those context experts, those that have experienced, I would imagine that a large majority, um, what makes them a context expert is also the same thing that's a hurdle to them getting to the table. Um, so think, for example, of a, a single mother, right? How can she spend four hours on a Tuesday night or whatever? Uh, being involved. So um, I guess my, my question is mm -hmm. that when the rubber hits the road here, now you've got me, Patty, thinking about all these different things because I say I'm wrong all the time too. Um, what does that actually look like to get those context people to the table um, when, when the thing that we need them for is what's the hurdle? <laughs> mm -hmm. or, I think, you know, um, at least with several of the city um, meetings that I've been a part of, you know, I see you all, you know, really being thoughtful about making sure child care is there, making sure that there's dinner provided if you're asking people to come to an event in the evening. You know, those are really key things to look at when thinking about how do we involve the context expert. And, you know, I, I want to thank you so much for bringing up that idea of, you know, feedback fatigue, <laughs> because that's really a real thing. And this connects to my additional answer is um, never ask people to share their opinion or their story if you're not willing to act on it. And um, that's especially important right now when we're looking at the racial injustice that everyone across the country is trying to grapple with. How do we bring our community back together? How do we do some healing? And one thing to remember with that is don't ask people to share their experience or their story if you're not willing to really dive into what that is, what we need to own and what we need to change. One of, one of the key areas that I think communities can do a lot with is, you know, Assessing where you're at with trust building. 
trust is such a key component of collaborating and you know what one person's perceptions of trust and their trust in our you know organizations who provide leadership in our community can be very different from another person's so you know doing some mapping about you know what are the perceptions of trust in order to see if the trust isn't where we want it to be and i, I imagine it probably isn't because it's not for many communities what do we do to strengthen those areas of trust and that's not to say that the city of Fort Collins hasn't done a lot of work around building that trust, but it's an ongoing process, right? It's a, you know, it's, it's a process that we just always need to work on. David, did you have anything to add? <laughs> yeah, I would just add, at least my view of trust is one of those, it's, it's a long time to build up and it can be quickly dismantled. And, you know, and that works in, you know, individual relationships, but also, um, you know, with community, you know, as an elected official, as a friend, as, as so forth. So, you know, and that's why um, I, I really like the way you're framing this. It's really a constructive way to, I think, getting at trust, but looking at all these perspectives and, um, you know, and I think your point is very well taken there that, um, that you know don't be don't ask for input if you're not willing to act upon it. So I think that's ability, you know that's why the process I think are important that you're able to capture and to do um, in addition to just convene, and and so that's um, you know that and that, you know that's a significant commitment more more than you maybe know at the outset, but you have to be ready to, 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 to act. I, I just want to point out, um, Sue wrote in a question that I think, Julie, kind of to your question, um, she says, how could context experts partner in co-creating the structures that support engagement for those with lived experience? Mm -hmm. and, and that to me just kind of thinks about um, the way that we create those engagement experiences, how do we ask people who want to engage how they want to engage. Mm -hmm. And so maybe providing feedback on like the parks and rec plan, the trails plan, the strategic plan, the, you know, like we, we want people's feedback into all these plans, but is that the best way for people to engage? And is that their preferred way to engage or how do we flip that? Um, mm -hmm. So Sue, thank you for that question. Kind of j just kind of sparked an idea. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah, and I've always thought like there's the kind of person that likes to fill out surveys and there's the kind of person that doesn't. So my husband is the doesn't and I'm the love it person, you know, so it's interesting. Yeah, because thinking about the way, not just where we engage, but the ways that we engage, I'd be interested in looking into that more too. Right. You know, and we haven't really mentioned it explicitly here, but then there's the pre-COVID, now the post-COVID and how, you know, that's challenged us in many ways, um, functionally as a city to engage, you know, as we have been, but also, you know, as an elected body, we've expanded the ways that enable citizens to engage with council, which again, I'm, it's very limited, very narrow, um, but we've provided for more avenues for that than we have historically. And, and you know, I. I, I view that as a, a positive outcome of, you know, having to work through some of that um, as, as a city council anyway, and our, our role and function. Yeah, and you know, many, many people are much more of an expert on how to engage online. And it's easier in some ways for some folks to connect with you online because they don't have to leave their home, they can occupy their kids in a different way and you know, feel like at least they can check, check into that. And then thinking about that, okay, so here's our opportunity. What kind of ways could we strengthen that online platform for people to engage? So you know, for meetings like this, can we move to having a line in our budget related to making sure that there's interpretation available at all meetings, whether or not we know whether it's going to be needed, 
really so that people feel like, oh, well, I can go to that meeting because I know no matter what, it's available in English and in Spanish or English and in Arabic. So just thinking through ways that you can, you know, connect with people to design that process, but also making it as inclusive as possible. Mm -hmm. Very good. Any other comments? You know, this is great. And I think it fits, it's very timely and it fits into a number of things that we're currently doing, council priorities and conversations, uh, sub, our subcommittee um, for council. Um, uh, I don't remember the full name, uh, Emily's the chair, uh, but it's- uh, Community co Impact. Co community Impact's kind of the short versions, that's right. So. Um, but, you know, I think that's so important and, and, and it is uh, important to council. So appreciate that. Um, and, and I think we just had two other comments. Sorry. Oh, Sorry, sure. Mayor. Um, one about opportunities to build better trust and authentically involve our community in the budget process. And it seems like we have a decide and announce approach rather than fully inclusive. Um, and then the other, oh, then the presentation will be available. So I, I can just respond to the budget and then curious to hear what others think. But this is something I think that council has started to talk about more, um, you know, with the with COVID and kind of moving into a shorter type um, time frame, it might be a little difficult this year. But I think with the year budget, we do have an opportunity to spend a year really thinking about what that looks like. And so for our next year budget, maybe try some new things out. Um, so that's where I, I hope to move in that um, that space. So thank you for that question, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. That's good. Very good. Any other comments? Well, uh, uh, David and, and Patty, thank you so much and uh, for joining us. And I'll I'll turn it over to Jackie. Are you ready, Jackie, for a, a perspective here? A summary? Yes, and just thank you so much. This was, um, Patty, so cool to get to this point. And David, I've been, it's been such a pleasure to meet you through this process, too. Um, and we're so glad to kind of, as you said, we haven't uh, deployed the diagnostic tool fully, so we're so lucky to kind of be at this stage with you all. So a few things, um, you know, one, I'm thinking about how we've been deciding about um, even hosting futures committee during this time. And it really has been to, yes, look at topics that we need to be thinking about now um, during COVID as we go for, you know, look towards the future of our community. As we think about COVID and reckoning with racial injustice that's happening here and now in our community. And then I think about the future of response and resilience and recovery and regeneration. Um, this is such a timely topic and just so thank you so much and thanks to the committee for saying that you really wanted to talk about community led processes this time because this just really resonates with so much for all thinking about as a community right now. Really um, loved your thinking to, you know, focus on families and different voices and, and that you highlighted youth. Um, as I shared with both you last week, um, our speakers last month for Futures were five um, young people from Fort Collins. And so it was really cool to kind of follow up that Futures with this conversation. Um, so thank you for that. And again, I, you know, we talked so much about co-creation in our community and I um, really appreciated just the focus on that co-creation being a range of voices and perspectives mm -hmm. and that um, kind of that civic muscle that you said is being able to wrestle with those really tough conversations together that actually like the conflict and the act of going through that and um, bringing in all together divergent views as part of the act of like strengthening this mu that muscle so thank you for that point too. And um, we talk about a lot as a community that we plan an act or this is a think and do tank. And so the framework of learn together, plan together, act together, um, I think really resonates too with the city as we're thinking about these things. And then that capacity around those vital social connections, gosh, how we've been all thinking about those during COVID, like the vital social connection, connections during this time. Um, the sense of belonging piece too paired with um, civic muscle and you know the sharing power question and how um, you know part of the civic capacity is both that uh, navigating you know how are we building skills to navigate the system but also changing the system together and, and redesigning the system and so I thought that was kind of an interesting thought like through the sharing power lens is as you have a systems approach 
um, there's like a co-creation in navigating it, but also changing and designing it new. And that kind of brought me to city as a platform. We often talk about the city's role of convener. And so I think this was really provocative of how are we not always the host? And where is city of a where is city as a platform can be a platform of sharing power, um, and really appreciated kind of the the recommendations already. I saw that through the civic capacity index that you kind of give these recommendations of where we might need to strengthen, and so highlighting that how do we think about when we're bringing um, you know trying to engage different voices that we have childcare and food, we're ready to act on it. It's you know part of the trust building experience. Um, and then, yeah, the ties to resilience, um, that, that cross literature and kind of cross functional is so timely right now too, because all of us are thinking about our community resilience and that civic capacity is a really big piece of that. Um, and uh, appreciated too, the, the cross sector approach that there's no one sector or one institution that can solve the community issues we're facing right now. And so civic capacity is really helps our ability to knit those different sectors together. Um, so as I think about kind of, you know, the, the think part and then the do tank, um, some opportunities I think that we're arising this conversation is we do have the equity indicators project that I think Patty, you and I touched on when we sat together that day that um, council is funding as part of your equity and inclusion priority. And even just talking with our consultant CUNY out of New York City, they were so excited when I shared that we were learning about the Civic Capacity Index because they said that they've worked in cities like Oakland and Tacoma and other places, that that's one of the um, things that they really want to assess as part of equity indicators. And so um, I think there can be some really cool connections with the project that we're undertaking now with equity indicators. Um, definitely the recovery plan as we think about what's our civic capacity to engage in our recovery planning as an um, as a community as an, as an organization and then like I said in the beginning kind of the connection to that reimagined engagement priority for council too you'll be having a work session on August 11th as part of this and thanks to Patty for highlighting kind of some of those early adopter processes in the city with home to health um, our climate future has been centering the work in equity um, and really looking at how are we engaging those most impacted, but historically have had the least impact or um, an influence in our, um, in our processes. And so really excited to kind of continue um, trying that, you know, in, in different processes. And really heard too the interest that BFO next year is one of those that we can really look at as we have an opportunity with a, a single year. And then lastly, just kind of the, you know, what, what have we learned through COVID? As we think about learn and plan and act together, what have we learned through COVID that we've been forced to change our ways to engage and what are some of those ways like this that we might wanna keep in some form um, because we're able to engage with more of our community members. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess the other thing is I'm really excited to stay in touch with you all about how we might um, utilize that diagnostic tool here in Fort Collins. Great, thank you, Jackie. As always, uh, great job summarizing and, and uh, and and uh, putting a point to uh, uh, a great presentation. So thank you so much. Um, uh, is there anything else for the good or the whole on this particular item? And so, um, so Jackie is, um, are we uh, want to talk about next future topics? Sure. So again, Patty and David, thank you so much. And thanks everyone who is spending your Monday um, late afternoon with us and weathering the storm outside altogether <laughs> here. Um, so next week, one of the other key topics that um, you as a committee identified would be really um, a timely topic during this period together is the future of work. And so Teresa Roche, our Chief Human Resource Officer, is engaging an uh, amazing thought leader, um, recent, you know, recent publications in Forbes and other places in terms of just really thinking about what does the future of work look like? What have we been learning during COVID and kind of some trends that we're seeing now? So that will be in August. And um, we have kind of the list. We're working on other um, topics that you've been interested in. We're working on engaging speakers there. But if there's any that you want to kind of put to the um, front of the line for September, I welcome that as well. Very good. Uh, that's very good. Teresa, I know you're on. So thank you, Teresa, for working with us and, and uh, given your uh, connections and channels, uh, I know it'll be a great topic. So thank you. Um, anything else for the, the good of the whole? 
Julie and Emily, thank you. As always, uh, great uh, to have you on this committee. And, and Jackie and and uh, Patty and David, thank you for uh, joining us. And and thank you all that have uh, joined us um, on this topic. And have a have a great Monday evening. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you.